Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast, everybody. It is me, Ryan Wilson. Will Brinson gets the day off yet again, but I'm joined by Josh Edwards, which means we are talking about the draft, specifically the 2021 NFL draft with, uh, with a focus on the quarterbacks, plus some of the top players that are also likely to find themselves landing in the first round, given how well they played uh, in what has been sort of a jumbled 2020 season in college football, but it still counts. You can watch us on YouTube if you're listening to us and you want to see my face and Josh's face. If you want to look at a man who is weeks away from having his first child, <laughs> uh, Josh Edwards is, is that man. You can find that on youtube.com forward slash pick six. And in case you missed it, you want more of me and Brinson, John Breach. We did the uh, Super Friends recap off that electrifying Monday Night Football game, Bears Vikings. You can find that in the feed now. And then on Wednesday, you'll find Will Brinson talking to Brady Quinn on the Brady Quinn Football Show. Uh, former Notre Dame quarterback, former NFL quarterback. Notre Dame is, uh, are they second in the country, Josh? I would, yeah, I think they are. Yeah, they're up there after that. I think they are. I haven't, I honestly haven't paid much attention to the rankings this year simply because, you know, Ohio State hasn't been playing for a while. And then new teams get thrown into the mix every single week. So I'm, I'm going to wait a few more weeks before I start really diving into that. Yeah, but they're definitely top two or top three after that huge win over yeah. Clemson a few weeks ago. So catch that. Will Brinson, Brady Quinn, they'll be talking all things NFL as well. But here, me and Josh going to talk about some uh, some draft stuff, which is um, I cover the NFL. I love covering the NFL, but I love, really love the draft. Like, where are you? Because you're a Kentucky guy, um, college Kentucky. It sounds like, are you a Ohio State fan? No, um, I don't want to turn too many people against me, but you kind of either grew up in the state of Ohio as an Ohio State fan or despising those that root for Ohio State. Right. Uh, I went to Ohio University, so I'll let you assume which category I fall into. <laughs> um, but that's all you get here in Ohio. So uh, Buckeyes football is, is prevalent even here in the, uh, the Queen City of Cincinnati. Oh, that's disrespectful to John Breach, who went to Miami of Ohio. You didn't even recognize that, that as, a, as a college in the state of Ohio. So do you like NFL or college better? Because um, I like them both for different reasons, but I, I do especially love talking about the college kids. Yeah, it's interesting because you get more of a raw passion when it comes to college football. Um, as far as actual gameplay and what I follow closely on a weekly basis, probably the NFL, I think I'm probably more invested in that. Um, at the same time, I mean, you know, as is our job, following college players and kind of projecting them to the NFL is is probably the funnest um, part of the whole job because, you know, you get to kind of take what you see from the college level and you get to apply it to what we see on a weekly basis in the NFL. So you kind of get a good, healthy mixture um, in in the, uh, the NFL draft profession. And unlike me, you actually – follow these kids in high school too because you uh talk a lot about kentucky football about the recruits coming in obviously that's an sec school power five school so, so they're getting some big name players so you've seen some of these kids from the age of 18 until it's sort of weird to think that as an 18 year old in three years there's a chance you're making 50 million dollars on a five-year deal so uh, uh I, I don't, stay in school i guess stay in school for three years <laughs> you don't have to necessarily go to class but uh yeah don't repeat that all right so we're here to talk about the kids that are in college that are almost certainly going to make the leap from college to the nfl uh, next season. Some of these kids are obviously juniors. Let's start at the top with Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields. And I'll be honest, both of these players have actually played better this year than they did last year. Trevor's rookie uh, rookie season, his freshman campaign, everyone was like, oh my gosh, this is the best player on earth. Last year's a sophomore. He sort of started slow and then got better. Justin was in his first year at Ohio State last year after uh, mystifyingly leaving Georgia. Like Georgia let him get away for Jake Fromm. And I, 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 I've heard that, I mean, Jake Fromm is, is a good college quarterback. He wasn't even a great college quarterback. Justin Fields is special. And I think he's played better this year too uh, with some of the question marks about him. Is there any way, and I can't envision the situation, but is there any way that neither Lawrence nor Fields ends up one and two? I would be surprised with the way that things have played out to this point, just because of how well Justin Fields has played. Um, you look at the athleticism that's required at the quarterback position in the NFL. Now, um, most of the quarterbacks that we're seeing have success on a weekly basis also have the ability to, to tuck the ball and run when the pocket breaks down. So you kind of have to have at least average athleticism and Justin Fields obviously has that in spades. Um, Trevor Lawrence, I mean, you talked about his freshman year, how sensational he was. And we start to project 
you know, his sophomore, his junior year and how special he could be. You know, you get these lofty comparisons that he's, he's like Andrew Luck and you start saying he's a generational player and then comes out in the sophomore season, like you said, a little bit slow. And I'm over here thinking, okay, maybe this isn't the surefire prospect that we thought he was. Maybe he's not going to go number one. And then he comes out the first game of his junior season and silences all doubts. I mean, he has played so well to start the season, the way that he um, is able to read defenses, his arm talent, his ability to run, all that kind of stuff. And then Justin Fields. I mean, if he had regressed or even shown what we saw last year, I would say that the door was open for him to possibly fall down below BYU, Zach Wilson, who has, has been really impressive this year. Another guy with, with great athleticism, but he hasn't, I mean, he's taken his game to another level and it's, it's been really impressive. So for me, I think it would be difficult for Zach Wilson to overtake either one of those guys. Um, But if their play does not match up with the first half of the season down the stretch, then maybe the door starts creaking open and, and, you know, we get a scenario where he slides into that second spot. Yeah, I, I'm, I feel the same way. In my last two mock drafts, uh, I think this is version 11 for us. Um, I had one, I had six quarterbacks in the last two mock drafts. Six probably almost certainly won't happen, but again, you do doing one every week, you sort of mix it up. But five feels like a realistic possibility. And we'll sort of touch on some of those names in a second, but I want to point out one other thing. So you mentioned Andrew Luck, and I think Andrew Luck – and Trevor Lawrence have this similarity in that they're both like slam dunk first overall picks more so than the, than the, the picks in between them in those years, 20, 2011, 2012 to 2020. But uh, so if you had to do a, a comp for Trevor Lawrence, my comp's going to blow your mind. Who is your comp for Trevor Lawrence and who's your comp for Justin Fields? Oh, wow. Um, Trevor Lawrence. I would almost say he's, a more accurate Josh Allen. Okay. Um, that works. Yeah. I would have to think a little bit longer on, on an exact comparison for that one. Justin Fields, I'd say he's, well, give me yours. I'll think on it for a minute. Give me, give me your comparison. So I'll start, I'll start with Justin Fields. Justin Fields to me feels like a slightly smaller, more accurate version of Cam Newton. Uh, yeah. I think he has a lot of that. Um, and he, 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 he he throws the football like someone who knows how to throw a football. Cam Newton has a sort of funky throwing motion. Right. Here's my comp for Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence is Justin Fields as uh, Justin Fields. Trevor Lawrence is Justin Herbert as a rookie. Oh, that's a, that is that's pretty good. Because I said I like all that. last year. Because I mean, I would imagine you feel the same way. I've yet to meet anyone who was like, yes, Justin Herbert's going to be a slam dunk superstar. I was like, after. Every other game, Justin Herbert made me so angry because he wasn't using the God-given tools to do what he should be doing he, yep. that he does every Sunday now. And I would say Justin Herbert is what people want. Like, they want Trevor, they want Justin Herbert to be Trevor Lawrence, but he's not that. And I'm saying this in 2019 and, and before the draft last year. But the way he's playing now, if, Justin, uh, if Trevor Lawrence plays like this next year, like Justin Herbert has as a freshman, uh, a rookie with the Chargers, that is a slam dunk, fantastic pick by the Jets. And you're getting way more than you bargained for, but other uh, comps otherwise they're they're hard to come by because I can't think of anyone who was Trevor Lawrence like on the field. Yeah, I would agree with that. The Justin Herbert comparison is is really interesting because we almost have to reprogram our minds from what we saw at Oregon compared to what we're seeing now. I mean, you know, I've heard you and Will and you know everybody else talk about how impressed you've been with Justin Herbert on the podcast to this point. And I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I've been totally surprised with what we've seen. We obviously knew he had a strong arm um, and he could push the ball down the field, but just his, his confidence, um, his, his patience in the pocket, his, his willingness to go through his progressions, um, you know, just giving his wide receiver. And that's one thing that he didn't have at Oregon is he didn't have that wide receiver talent that maybe he could trust and right. we've kind of seen that in the NFL because he's he's throwing into such tight windows. He's throwing before guys are open. He's throwing when, you know, you might say that 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 they're well covered, that, you know, there's there's just a very small hole. And he's throwing it up to his wide receiver and just giving him an opportunity. We didn't see that at Oregon. So you're seeing a lot more patience and just overall comfort in this this Chargers offense that we didn't see when he was in Eugene. That's right. So no one to throw the ball to. His tight end got hurt last year. I can't remember his name. I actually liked him a lot. Um, 
it's like number 20 something. And also that Mario Cristobal offense, Jacob Breland, Jacob Breland. Thank you. That Mario yeah. Cristobal offense did not suit what Justin Herbert was good at. So there are a lot of reasons and it makes you have to go back as someone who is supposed to try to figure out if these kids can be good or not, try to figure out what happens and why it happens. And this is like a head scratcher, but I think you're, you're onto something and he's playing with a ton of confidence and there are the concerns about him not being a, an outspoken leader. No one on that team seems to care when he's whizzing balls into tight windows and, uh, you know, Keenan Allen's making plays and Mike Williams is making plays. Uh, Hunter Henry, it's, it's a ton of fun to watch. And every week I apologize to Justin and I'll do it again this week. Sorry, Justin. All right. So speaking of sort of that, let's talk about some of the people whose stock has been up because I think last year it was fair to say that, that Justin Herbert's stock was down most of the time. He had a few big games, but a lot of times, you know, again, head scratchers, but stock up and um, guys who coming into the season, you know, there are questions about more so than, than maybe answers, but that they've done a lot to change your opinion. And uh, let's start with the quarterbacks. You mentioned him earlier, Zach Wilson, Zach Wilson. So I, you know, you do the same thing in the summer. You, you go over a list of guys who so you're familiar with them headed into their junior and senior seasons. And of all the quarterbacks, Zach Wilson wasn't really on my radar. I feel like Shane Bouchelle was more so than even Zach Wilson, the kid out of SMU, but Zach Wilson, good Lord. Uh, here are my comps for, for Zach Wilson and you can agree or, or disagree. It's fine. Um, your guy, Johnny Manziel at, 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 uh, in college at, at Texas A&M at his best and Baker Mayfield at Oklahoma. Like he's a mix of those two guys as college players, but he's more accurate. And I think he might be as athletic or maybe slightly more athletic. I would agree with that. I, I would, I'd, I certainly wouldn't put Baker in, in Johnny's athleticism category, but you're talking about those guys in a six, three frame. I mean, Zach right. Wilson, his arm talent this year has, has been awesome. And I would like to see him do a little bit better of a job throwing the ball on the run. Um, but his command of the offense, his mobility, again, we talked about having needing to have that athleticism, that mobility at the quarterback position to succeed in the NFL today. Zach Wilson has that in spades. He's a guy that, you know, if the play breaks down, if somebody's not getting open and, you know, we just talked about this with Justin Herbert at Oregon, if people are not getting open, then you kind of have to improvise and find ways to get yardage elsewhere. And, and Zach Wilson has that ability when the pocket breaks down um, he's, he's, he's got good awareness when he's in the pocket. So when he's starting to feel pressure, he he's willing to get out of there and get some additional yardage. So I like that about his game, but his arm strength, you know, he's really starting to drive the ball a lot better this year. Um, and to me, I think that's, that's where we've seen the biggest increase, um, in his game. The reason that his stock is, has gone up so much this year. I was a huge Jordan love guy last year and I spent most of the spring making excuses for him. Um, you know, no one around him, new offensive line, new coaching staff. He had to try to do too much. Uh, but the level of competition he faced last year, Utah State, is similar to the competition that Zach Wilson faces, and that's been one of the knocks on Zach Wilson. So if you're willing to give Jordan Love props for the way he, he did sort of projecting his athleticism and arm strength to the next level, there's no reason to not give Zach Wilson props for pl- uh, facing that same talent and absolutely dominating. Like, I don't have any issues about the, the talent level differences between Zach Wilson and, and uh, playing in Alabama or Florida or wherever. Uh, are you – any concerns with that for you? No, and he played really well against Boise State last year, which is – or last week, which is probably going to be the toughest game on his schedule. Um, but I think we have to be careful being contradictory and being hypocritical like you just said because if we're willing to give Jordan Love the same – you know, the benefit of the doubt, then we've got to be willing to do the same with Zach Wilson, especially when he's not showing the the types of concerns that we saw from Jordan Love last season. Um, You know, you you're only able to play against the competition on your schedule. So we can't fault him for not playing against Alabama and Clemson when he's not given that opportunity. So um, while I would love to see him against those types of teams, that's simply not feasible. And what you have to do is take what you're seeing against the Boise State's um, the Western Kentuckys and kind of try to translate that to the next level. And I think what's so important, um, I was actually listening to Daniel Jeremiah talk about this um, on their podcast, and they were essentially saying, you know, we need to, rather than saying it's a good player or a bad player, we need to be saying what kind of a situation they need to be in to be successful. What do they need to do to be successful? What kind of an offense do they need to be in? All these kind of descript- descriptive factors um, that we can kind of explain who a prospect is rather than just taking the apples and oranges of, well, this guy played Western Kentucky and this guy played Alabama. 
that's a great point. And you did, you basically did that with Justin Herbert explaining why, you know, Oregon wasn't a great fit. And again, I don't know where, who that's a great fit for if you don't have wide receivers and how it sort of worked out with the chargers. All right. Using that, that logic, uh, tell me what you think about this. In my latest mock draft, I had, uh, this is another stock up guy, Mac Jones, Alabama quarterback. I had him going to Alabama. Uh, he's at Alabama. I had him going to Atlanta. He reminds me a little bit of Matt Ryan. Now, is that a good fit for him? I mean, obviously Julio Jones, Taylor and his career still playing at a high level. Uh, they have uh, Mari Cooper. They have Hayden Hurst. So they have playmakers there. I, you can, I guess Todd Gurley is a first round pick and that's something they were bragging about for a while, but the way Mac Jones has played this year uh, has been a similar ascent to that of, uh, of Zach Wilson in that we knew who Mac Jones was last year. He came in and we all thought, okay, this is just AJ McCarron 2.0. He's basically a caretaker while Tua was hurt. Right. Uh, but he might be the best deep ball thrower in college football and you know, okay. Jalen Waddell, um, you have Mechie, you, you have, uh, of course, uh, Devonta Smith that helps, but you still, to your point, you have to make the throws. I mean, if guys are wide open, 80 yards down the field, you still have to get the ball to them, get, get to them on time, get to them accurately. And he seems to do that better than anyone. He seems very confident in the pocket. And I, I think this guy's a first round pick. I know some teams really like him and they like him like top three type quarterback. Yeah. He's probably going to fall outside of that for me. I, I, th- I think I just have these preconceived notions of him last season because I think he just is throwing hit his, his comfort in the pocket has definitely grown from last year to this year. And I think that's obviously to his credit, he's got a better understanding of the off- offense and looks more confident when he's back there. Um, if we're willing to give to a, um, you know, the benefit of the doubt throwing to guys like Devonte Smith and throwing to Jalen Waddle and Jerry Judy and Henry Ruggs, you know, he had all of those guys last year too. And we didn't knock him for that. So Mac Jones, he's got the talent. We can't, you know, we can't, we can't downgrade him because he's got that level of talent. I mean, he's making the most of it. Like you said, he's one of the best downfield throwers in college football this season. And that's an aspect that we've seen, from Russell Wilson. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that makes Russell Wilson special is his ability to drop passes in the bucket from 50 yards downfield. Um, as it relates to Atlanta, I think that's an interesting fit because I do see similarities with Matt Ryan, but I will, I'll ask you this because this is something that I struggle working with mock drafts each week is if Atlanta is going to take a quarterback because we don't know who the, who the head coach is going to be yet. Obviously Matt Ryan has, a difficult contract. Um, you know, you can't realistically get him off the books for another couple of years. So you would take Mac Jones with the idea that he's going to sit and learn from Matt Ryan for a year or two. And that's totally fine. But I just wonder, I just wonder if it Atlanta is in the same headspace. I think they would be wise to take a quarterback because I think when you're that high in the draft and you have an opportunity to take one of those elite quarterbacks, you have to jump on that occasion, but I can also understand certain head coaches coming in and saying, you know, we believe that we can compete right, right now with Matt Ryan. I don't want to plan for the future. So, you know, you come out, you take a different position in need. Maybe you take an edge rusher and you bypass the quarterback position. That's obviously going to benefit you for the first couple of years, but then a decade down the road, maybe you regret not taking a guy like Mac Jones there. So I'm, I'm curious if you have the same kind of inner struggle when you're picking for Atlanta each week. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. Because when you, you look at uh, Matt Ryan's contract, 2021, his dead cap is, is almost $55-0 million. So that's a, that's a concern. And you would have to draft a quarterback with the understanding that Matt Ryan, as a 36-year-old, which is what he'll be next year, will have to be there for one more year. But, uh, yeah, so that, that's one of the concerns. The other concern is, as you know, Josh, when you do a mock draft every week, you got you to mix, mix it up. <laughs> so, all right, so you're not as high on Mac Jones as I am, but, but you, you recognize that he's certainly gotten better. Uh, I think um, this one's uh, this feels like a layup to me, the next, the next quarter we're going to talk about. Uh, so Kyle Trask out of Florida. I was impressed with the way he played last year coming in for Felipe Franks because Kyle Trask hadn't played a lot of football up to that point. Felipe Franks is, you know, athlete, got hurt. Uh, he didn't really blow, blow my hair back in terms of the way he played as a quarterback and projecting that as an NFL player. But Kyle Trask came in, and, and he was sort of a prototypical pocket passer, game manager, quote-unquote, but in a good way. And this year, he, he's been even better. And, you know, he's throwing 
14, 15 touchdowns a game, it feels like. Having Kyle Pitts, the tight end certainly helps that. Having Kadarius Toney and, and Trevon Grimes certainly helps that. Um, the issue I have with Kyle Trask is arm strength. Like a lot of the things he does pre-snap, a lot of in terms of going his progressions, I'm quite comfortable with, and I, I think he gets better, especially for not having played that much football. The arm strength is a concern for me. He's probably not a first-round pick. He's the number six quarterback I've had going in the first round in the last few weeks just to, to mix it up. But are there any concerns about Kyle Trask, football player, that um, haven't been alleviated by the way he's played over the last four, five, six weeks? No, I think we kind of know who he is. I mean, the ball placement that he's shown has been tremendous. Even without uh, Kyle Pitts on the field this past week, like his his understanding of how to hold the safety with his eyes before throwing it over the top, which he did to uh, to Kyle Pitts' backup, Keon Zipperer, um, a couple of times was fantastic. I mean, that's that's advanced level play at the quarterback position. So you would hope to see that. Um, so the ball placement has been fantastic. He's an incredibly tough kid. He's taken a lot of hits. Um, you know, he's got good pocket presence. He doesn't have the mobility that you would hope to see from the quarterback position, but um, the touch that he throws, um, you know, the touch on his throws, the ball placement, like all of that stuff, he just makes the game look so easy. And I'm afraid of falling into this trap of saying, okay, he doesn't have a lead arm strength. He's not the most mobile and then overlooking some of these qualities that he has as a, as a natural passer, you know, his touch, the ball placement, his, his willingness to go through the progressions, um, understanding of defenses, all that kind of stuff is going to allow him to be successful in the NFL. So it's certainly going to be an interesting conversation over the next, you know, five months as we sit here and try to say, where does he stack up with all these other quarterbacks? Because you look at, you know, maybe some some athletic traits that he doesn't stack up as well with other quarterbacks. And then the the high intelligence, the football IQ, the intangibles, all that kind of stuff tests off the charts. So if you find a team that's going to be in the right position to take him and, and you know, maybe they feel that he's the final piece to take their team to the playoffs, you know, maybe they feel like they've got a good supporting cast and they just need a solid guy to come in and, and distribute the football. Maybe Kyle Trask is that guy. Maybe he's a long-term backup. I don't know. What I do know is that he's going to find success in the NFL uh, for a long time, just because of what he does do well in the football field. I'm with you. And I was just looking at last year's draft class. Jalen Hurts was a second round pick. Then the, the next quarterback taken was, was Jacob Eason. He feels to me, he's not the athlete Jacob Eason is, but he's much more polished than Jacob Eason was coming out. And we all thought, at least I did, I thought Jacob Eason, might even go as high as the second round. Clearly, uh, NFL teams disagreed. Um, let's see what else we got here. Drew Locke was a second round pick. Right now, I'm taking Kyle Trask every day of the week over Drew Locke. I like Drew Locke coming out, but he has struggled. Will Greer was a third round pick, and he's I, I, I didn't love Will Greer coming out of West Virginia. And um, the Panthers apparently don't either because they don't play him even when Teddy gets hurt. Okay, speaking of one of uh, Kyle Trask's teammates, Kyle Pitts was quite well-known coming into the season because of his athleticism, but I think he's even improved his stock even more because he ends up catching half of Kyle Trask's touchdowns. He is basically Darren Waller, and he may even be more athletic than Darren Waller, which is hard to wrap your brain around. Um, would you be surprised? Like, if he were a top-10 pick, would, would that surprise you? No, not at all. And I think, I think what could prevent that happening is the teams that are in the top-10 um, as well as the quarterbacks. I mean, you know how it goes when you see quarterbacks rise in the draft. It's going to push some maybe top 10 caliber players out of the top 10, and that could be a case with Pitt, certainly. Um, you know, I'm trying to find comparison or uh, some teams that could be fits for him throughout the first round. And the ones that jump out to me are, are Cincinnati, um, Carolina, and Arizona. I think he would be great with all three of those teams. The issue is it's looking like, Cincinnati might stick into the top 10, but they've got such an easy schedule ahead. I mean, it's entirely possible that they reel off some victories, you know, coming up and they get outside the top 10. So it's, it's a matter of which team is going to take him in the top 10. That's the only issue that I find. Is he a top 10 caliber player? Absolutely. Because you look at DeAndre Hopkins, what we saw this past week, um, his ability to go up and get the football to high point it um, and make a 50, 50 ball his, I mean, there are certain players we talk about um, as turning 50, 50 balls into 80, 20 balls, you know, they're going to come down with it more often than not. And Kyle Pitts, Deandre Hopkins, those kind of guys are 80, 20 kind of guys. So 
Would I want a guy like that on my team? Absolutely. If I can get him um, in the top 10, if I have that chance and it's a need, I'm definitely doing it because I'm, I'm very confident in the type of player that he is. It's just a matter of, you know, which team is going to take him. What if the Chargers take him at five? They currently have the fifth pick. I mean, you talk about Justin Fields, Justin Herbert's comfort. I'm going to call him Justin Fields for the rest of the time. Justin Herbert's comfort with throwing to guys who are actually good. Yeah. One more playmaker. Hunter Henry's on his franchise tag. Maybe he leaves. They need help everywhere else, but you have Kyle Pitts staring you in the face. I, I'm not opposed to it, but I'll tell you this. Panay Sewell better be off the board when, yes. if, if, uh, if they're taking Kyle Pitts. Um, beyond yep. that, I mean, I struggle to find – the real blue chip players that's at the top of this class outside of the quarterback position. So, you know, outside of Panay Sewell and maybe Micah Parsons, you know, who are those guys that I'm going to be willing to write my name down for? Uh, who, who's going to be the guy that I, that I write on the card when I'm turning in at the draft. And I think Kyle Pitts is the kind of guy that you take a chance on in the top 10. I mean, Tight ends traditionally have not fared well when they're taken in the top 10. So maybe that's a little bit of a concern, but when you look at what Kyle Pitts does on the football football field, and I mean, he, he looks more like a wide receiver in his frame, but what he does so well, he's going to be a matchup issue for, for any team that he plays in the NFL, because he does have tremendous athleticism and you've got to account for that if you're the opposing team. Yeah, and you make a good point about sort of projecting these tight ends. I mean, Noah Fant's been pretty good. He hasn't been great, but again, you have Drew, Drew Locke throwing you the ball. That's a concern. Um, Kyle Pitts is a better athlete than Noah Fant, and, and Noah Fant's a fantastic athlete. Absolutely. He's a better athlete than Hawkinson, who's a different type of player uh, who went higher than Noah Fant his teammate in Iowa. But Hawkinson hasn't done anything, uh, done, hasn't done much. And, and again, that's a function of, of probably where the landing spot. So it's sort of hard to predict these guys, but there's no doubt in Kyle Pitts' athleticism. Um, Compared to anyone in this draft class, he's one of the best athletes in this draft class. And finally, for my stock up guys, I had Najee Harris running back at Alabama. And, you know, the issue, every time you talk to someone about Najee Harris, they're like, hey, he's just low. He might run a 4-7 at the combine, but no one really cares if running backs are slow. I mean, you can't be um, Elijah Holyfield and run a 4-9-5. Now, you can't do that. But if you're 4-6-5 to 4-7-5 or whatever, and you play the way Najee Harris does, that's good enough. I, he feels like a second-round pick to me. Um he probably would have gone after the group of guys that went in the second round last year, uh, probably before Zach Moss, uh, as I think about it. Um, he's catching the ball more. He's always been able to do that. Uh, is he better than Travis Etienne? No, he's not. Etienne's actually catching the ball more this, this year. He's on pace, too, anyway, than he did last year. But Etienne's fumbled the ball a few times. It's been sort of weird, something he hasn't struggled with. But I love the way Harris plays. He, he runs angry. He does a lot of the things that you want. And he's a little slippery than he looks just by, by, the, by the way he, you know, he looks like a bowling ball, but I think he's much more than that. Yeah, Najee Harris, you know, I, I've kind of worried about how upright he runs at times. And I was I was trying to look up Derrick Henry's 40-yard dash time um, while you were talking there. He ran a 4-5-4. Four, four. So good. those are going to be the obvious comparisons between Derrick Henry and Najee Harris because they are bigger backs. And I think Najee kind of runs – he does run a little bit upright. But what he brings to the table from an athleticism standpoint, his ability to catch passes out of the backfield um, – He's a unique talent. I mean, we do not see the type of big running backs with his physical traits very often. How many times have we seen him hurdle a secondary player in the open field? I mean, that kind of athleticism just can't be taught. It's something that you're born with. So, again, it may be a matter of finding the right fit for him uh, because he's probably not going to fit in every team's scheme. But there is a fit for Najee Harris in the NFL because his traits – are just incredible. And when you look back at Derrick Henry and his draft process, there were so many people that doubted him and questioned if he was going to be a feature back in the NFL, because we just haven't seen many players, his size have success in the NFL. And, you know, looking back on that now, that was a flawed way of thinking. And, you know, honestly, the way that we evaluate a lot of positions is, is outdated right now, because you look at the way that the, the Patriots, are running out their offensive linemen every week. They've got one guy that's over six foot four on their starting offensive line. So, I mean, this NFL is completely different from what we've seen in the past. You've got sub six foot quarterbacks, every direction that you look starting on Sunday. So, you know, there, there's definitely going to be a place for Najee Harris in the NFL. Um, it may take a creative play caller like, 
um, you know, Kyle Shanahan that's that's going to use him appropriately. But there is a play caller in the NFL that's going to use him to the best of his ability. So I have no problem at all with Najee Harris is probably a day two pick just from value alone. Um, I have no problem with that whatsoever. He's, he's just got to go to the right team. Yep, yeah, And I think that's sort of the takeaway. You have to have these kids fit in the right places because it does. I mean, so many, no disrespect, Josh, so many careers have been ruined because they've gone to Cleveland with Fred Kitchens <laughs> or, or Hugh Jackson or whoever the, you know, the coach was and you're like, okay, this is, this, there's no chance for success because the ownership right. is, is doing crazy stuff. Um, all right, let's get to your stock up list. Let's start with uh, Quitty Pay. Edge rusher out of Michigan. I'll, I'll preface it by saying this. I watched him over the summer. And I was like, okay, this guy's a great athlete. He looks like a day three pick because he has no idea what he's doing. He spent a lot of time this summer getting better. Like, is he blew, has blown the doors off what uh, he looked like last year? I haven't watched all the Michigan games, but the times I've seen him play, I, I've been very impressed. No question. I mean, his size, first of all, six foot four, 277. Uh, he's rocked up. I mean, there's not an ounce of fat on his body. Uh, the opening game, you know, he didn't really show I shouldn't say he didn't show up until the fourth quarter, but he really dominated that fourth quarter. So I started thinking like, is he just a guy that's going to capitalize in the moment, um, you know, and feast on quarterbacks down the stretch, or is he a guy that's going to win down in and down out? So, um, you know, I went back and I watched the Indiana game really was kind of quiet in the first quarter. And then the second quarter, he was just like everywhere. Like he just, he, he just flashed. Um, every single play. And it was so impressive because he has the ability to turn speed into power, uh, which is something that you obviously want to see out of your edge rushers, because if their speed rush is halted, that's going to be the end of the play for, for some edge rushers. Um, if you're able to turn that speed into power and maybe you start bullying the, the tackle, that's going to give you a chance. So that's what I've seen out of Quiddy Pay to this point. Um, he's not getting washed out of his, out of his gaps. Like he did in 2019, he's holding the point of attack. Um, and he's making better plays in the run game. That's something that I did not see last season. So to his credit, he's improved there. Um, better use of his hands. You know, he showed a, a pin pull against Indiana this past week. He had a rip around the edge. He's not a guy that's going to show elite bend at the waist. You know, he, he doesn't have, that same bend that we've seen from Miles Garrett or Brian Burns or, or even Josh Allen. Um, but he does so many other things well that maybe I hesitate to put him, you know, consistently in the top 10, but I think the difference that he makes on the football field is, is, is definitely one of the best at a, at a somewhat lean edge rusher position. I don't think we've really seen anybody kind of, take that number one edge rusher role this year. And I think Quiddy Pay has that, that possibility to be that guy because he does show some of those traits where he's going to be able to win every single rep. So I'm incredibly encouraged by what I've seen from him to this point. And I think there's still a little bit of way for him to go, but he's trending in the right direction. Here's my rough comp for Quiddy Pay. Not exactly because these guys are, aren't the same size. Quiddy Pay is a, a bigger, but your guy, Bud Dupree. Insanely athletic, took him two, two and a half years to sort of figure it out Pittsburgh. And now he is, he's pretty freaking good. It helps to have TJ on the other side, but he's doing a lot of the heavy lifting himself, but coming out, you're all, you're going on. Okay. He ran a four five and look at him. <laughs> Those were the yeah. reasons you drafted him. Um, I didn't watch him play a lot of Kentucky, but I, I knew sort of the, the scouting report on him and he's gotten a ton better. And I feel like Quiddy pay could go down that path. Just a sheer freak athleticism. And you just learn how, I mean, you, you get a job, you learn how to do it. Uh, day one, you're not going to be very good. Year five, you're going to be pretty good. Yeah. I mean, you're knocking it out of the park with the, with the comparisons today because I struggle to come up with those <laughs> yeah, off the top of my head, but uh, Bud Dupree is pretty good. You know, what we saw from Bud Dupree going into his contract year, he just decided I'm the better player and I'm going to win. Like he, you could see the light turn on in his eyes. <laughs> right. He, he was going to dominate every single play because he's just like, you know, you don't belong on the football field with me. He started to use his hands better uh, than we had seen previously. So his ability to see the light turn on and we worried that, you know, maybe it was just because he was in a contract year that has simply not been the case to this point. I mean, he looks fantastic. And I think that's who he is going forward. Um, and I think Quiddy Pay is, I think maybe the light has turned on for him as well. So 
if we're in the early stages of what we saw from Bud Dupree with Quiddy Pay, I mean, stock up. Right, exactly. Uh, you mentioned the thin edge rusher class. Uh, another guy who's turned it on in, in recent weeks, and I, and I first saw him in that Oklahoma State game a few weeks ago, Joseph Asai for, for Texas. I'm looking at a stat line just to refresh my memory. And Oklahoma State is a good football team. He had uh, six tackles for loss, three sacks. Earlier in the year against TCU, he had three and a half tackles for loss and a sack. He has been hard to, to, to control, too, and it, it's been fun watching him. Uh, what do you like about him? So, and Oklahoma State has has two good offensive tackles, too. Both will probably be drafted with uh, Tevin Jenkins, who's probably one of my favorite underrated tackles in the class, and then Josh Sills um, on the other side. But uh, Joseph Osai, I mean, when I was looking at him last year, Texas used him more in an off-ball off ball kind of role, um, and that was, not his, that was not his forte. That's not where he was going to excel. Um, you could see when he was playing hand, hand in the dirt – on some of those small sample edge rush uh, plays that he was fantastic. I mean, you could see all of the ability that he had as an edge rusher. And then I think Texas kind of realized what they had in him this off season, because that's how they've deployed him more this year. He's playing hand in the dirt. He's getting off the, off the ball. Um, and that's like you said, led to four, four sacks, but something that I look forward, I look for with edge rushers is forced fumbles because you look at Josh Allen, you look at Brian Burns, those guys were fantastic when it came to strip sacks. I mean, their bend at the waist, their ability to get around the corner and then strip the ball out of the quarterback's hands was elite. And you kind of see that with Joseph Osai a little bit because when he gets around the corner, he's going for the ball every single time. That's why you've seen three forced fumbles, one fumble recovery this season. Um, and as you know, there's no bigger impact on the football field than, than turning the other team over. So Joseph Asai, you know, we've seen a small sample size. But again, I think as he grows more comfortable in that role, he's just only going, only going to get better. No, I'm with you. And um, uh, uh, the next guy I want to talk about, I think it's pretty clear that uh, some combination of either Caleb Farley, Caleb Farley out of Virginia Tech or Patrick Sertan out, out of Alabama are the top two cornerbacks. After that, though, it feels pretty wide open. There are a lot of kids that are really good athletes and are sort of growing into the roles. There's some, some technicians. Uh, and then this guy uh, who just opted out for the rest of the season, and I wholly support that. J.C. Horn, the cornerback out of South Carolina. His dad is Joe Horn, uh, the, the receiver that played forever in the NFL with the Saints. Um, I like J.C. Horn a lot. He is – nasty he shut down seth williams uh, in the auburn game earlier this this year seth williams isn't a, dy a dynamic wide receiver he's sort of a big for lack of a better word lumbering he's sort of a target guy but he's he's still physical and really good player uh and we've seen jc horn sort of make those strides we saw glimpses of it last year what do you like about him yeah seth williams i mean he dominated kentucky so to see jc horn do so well against a guy that is kind of one of those 80, 20 guys as well. When the ball's in the air, he's going to come down with it more often than not. Um, it's pretty impressive. By the way, that's a better way to put it. I, instead of calling him lumbering, he, he's, more <laughs> of, he's, he's more of a Anquan Bolden type. He's not lumbering. My bad. So. No, you're good. And uh, you know, JC Horn, he, he's incredibly quick. His ability to mirror the receiver down the field is, is up there with the best in this class because his movement is so natural, you know, when he's, when he's, more so in, in bail coverage, because when you kind of see him in a back pedal, it's, it's still a little bit clunky. He's going to have to get that ironed out with his footwork. Um, that's one of the issues that, that I have with him, but he was actually in my initial first round when nice. we had our post 2020 draft mock. And it's not to say that I felt he was going to be a first round pick for sure, but you could see flashes of that talent because that first round ability is there. You just needed to see it more consistent. And although he did opt out last night, I believe, I think that's that's pretty recent news, there's still a lot of his play that can improve. I mean, I talked about his footwork, but he's still pretty handsy into his routes as well. Um, you know, and that's going to get flagged more often than not in the NFL. Now, what I'm encouraged by, you talk about some of that nastiness that you saw against Alabama. I didn't see that on film last year. I didn't see the type of aggressive physical player um, this year that uh, or last year that I saw this year, he's taken his game up a notch in that, in that, at that aspect. 
similar to what I talked about with Bud Dupree earlier, you just, you kind of look at the guy across from you before the snap and you just say, I'm better than this guy. I'm going to win this rep. I think we've kind of seen that from JC Horn this year. Um, and he's taken his game to another level, but again, there's, there's still definitely some untapped potential there for, uh, for Joe Horn's son. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, this next guy, actually, I haven't watched him, so I'm interested to hear, get my first scouting report on Bubba Bolden, the defensive back for, for the U. So um, I did a podcast with the Miami 24-7 sports site, who uh, is, is also in our network earlier this year. And I'll be honest, I hadn't studied Bubba Bolden either. So I went back, I looked at 2019. Um, I saw a guy that, you know, was – was definitely very talented, but had, had a lot of room for growth in the sense that he wasn't really confident in what he was seeing in front of him. And I think this year you see a much more confident player. He's kind of unlocked some of that ability that, that we've been hoping for. This was a guy that originally signed with USC. He was a top 10 player in the country. Um, didn't work out there in Los Angeles. So he transfers to Miami And it's taken him a little bit of time, but I think the game is finally starting to slow down for him. I'm, I I think I've seen him make a few plays in the box. So I'm thinking, you know, is he, is he just a box safety? And then I watched him earlier this year. um, I want to say maybe Virginia tech. I'd have to check on that. I can't remember which game it was, but he made a fantastic play in coverage coming over the top. And that's something that I hadn't seen from him in the past. So if you start talking about a guy that can play in the box and he's, doing well in coverage. Um, I'm very intrigued. I, I think he's still got a lot of learning, but I'm very intrigued with what I've seen from Bubba Bolin to start this season. All right. I'm putting him on my list. So I'm going to be looking out for him. And, and finally, the the last stock up guy on your list, Christian Darasal, the offensive tackle for Virginia Tech. Um, I, he wasn't on, on my radar this off season. He's been talked up a lot. Uh, I saw a little bit uh, of the game against Miami where Quincy Roche is a day one, day two edge rusher transfer from Temple is at the U now. He had huge issues with Christian Derrissaw. Uh, what do you like about him? Yeah, Roche was was neutralized in in every sense, and that was not a good player just capitalizing on a raw player that didn't know how to use his hands or anything like that. You know, Quincy Roche is one of the best in this class when it comes to using his hands and his technique and, you know, everything that comes with it. And Christian Derrissaw shut him down. Um, you know, he's got a guard-like body, so – this is this is that conversation that we've seen with Jonah Williams and um, some other guys in the past. We might see it with Rashawn Slater out of Northwestern this year. Yep. He can play offensive tackle um, and Robert Hunt for last year. That's another good one. Um, he can play tackle, but I think some teams might look at him as an interior offensive lineman because of his frame, um, his height and weight. You know, he's six foot five, 314, looks like a guard. But if you've got a guy that can play tackle, you don't move him simply right. because you think he looks like a guard. By the uh, way, the Jack, tackle- sorry to interrupt you, but going back to your point about why the pay, the, the Patriots doing things differently and, and the over overarching point that maybe we need to reevaluate these things. You don't, I mean, if a guy's arms are 33 and a quarter inches and not 33 and a half inches, you don't have to kick him inside if, if he's a good player. So I'm with you on that. I just wanted, wanted to interject my, my, uh, Ex- support. yeah, I mean, exactly. That's, that's kind of how the narrative has, has changed for us. So, Christian Darisol, he's got a little bit better size than Rashawn Slater and, uh, you know, probably pretty similar to Jonah Williams, but looks like a guard. So he, I could see some teams saying that he'll probably have to play inside. I don't think he has to. He's he's incredibly quick footed on on uh, the line of scrimmage. What I'm impressed with is he's very controlled. There's no wasted movements. Um, you know, when you look at Quincy Roche, that's a guy that has been in a lot of first round projections. So there's, it would have been understandable if Christian Darisol had looked across the line and said, man, that's Quincy Roche. He's a first round pick. Like, how am I going to hold up against this guy? We didn't see that. So the fact that you are able to shut a player down like that, you're not in your head too much. Um, and you're just able to, to come out and play every snap. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty exciting because that's a guy that's not going to um, get overwhelmed in the moment. You know, there's going to be a time in the NFL where you look at, at uh, Tristan Wurst, for example, you know, he's going against Cam Jordan, one of the best edge rushers in the NFL. At times, that game probably got a little out of his hands. Um, you've got you've to have the, the wherewithal to kind of dig deep and snap out of those 
you know, wow, look, I'm in the NFL. I'm going against Cam Jordan. I'm going against Miles Garrett. Like you're an NFL player now. You got to snap out of that kind of stuff. And I think what we've seen from Christian Darisol is is pretty encouraging to the idea that it's not going to be too big for him. The moment is not going to be too big for him, and he's going to be able to translate pretty seamlessly to the next level. I'm with you. I'm with you. And in fact, this offensive tackle class is actually relatively deep. There won't be the athletes in that class like we saw with Tristan Wurst, for example, or or Makai Becton, but there are going to be a lot of good players can come in and contribute immediately. And then the conversation will probably include, should we kick this kid inside or not? But I'm with you on, on the way he's played so far. And, and um, there's a lot to be said for confidence because we talk about the edge rushers lacking confidence, like Bud Dupree early in his career and maybe Quiddy Pay last year and sort of turning the corner. So those are our stock up guys. That is it for the podcast. We're going to come back later and do stock down. We got so engrossed in talking about quarterbacks and, and, you know, I'd much rather talk about all the good things these, these kids are doing and not why they're losing millions of dollars based on their play. <laughs> so we'll revisit that conversation later, but that's it for me, Ryan Wilson and Josh Edwards. This is the pick six podcast. We'll catch you later. <laughs>